Welcome to our series of live streams from the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. And let me introduce to you our two panelists, Flore Kunst and Ignacio Zirak. Flore Kunst was born in 1991 and grew up in the Netherlands. She studied at the Utrecht University. After that, she did her PhD first at the Free University of Berlin and later at the Stockholm University, supervised by Professor Berkholz. Since October 2019, Flore continues her research as a postdoc here in the theory division at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. Her research is highly complex, and the next part is only for those who know quantum physics. But even though you might not understand a word, I am optimistic you will understand the complexity of her thoughts and the theories she's working on. As a Max Planck Harvard postdoctoral fellow, she develops new theories about non-equilibrium topological phases within the single particle limit and in many body systems. The most important aspect of these phases is the existence of robust electric states on the boundaries, which are protected by the topological properties of the entire system. Due to their exotic properties, it might be possible to use these phases to develop quantum computers as well as build a new generation of transistors. <laughs> and now to Professor Ignacio Zirak. He is one of our five directors here at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics and the head of the theory department. We scheduled this talk for today because it is actually another important anniversary. To the day, exactly 25 years ago, a paper by Ignacio Zirak and Peter Zola was published in the physical review letter called quantum computation with cold trapped ions. 25 years ago, can you imagine that? <laughs> that was in 1995. I think my family did not even have a normal computer back then. And it was many years before I first heard about a quantum computer. But these two, Ignatius Dirac and Peter Zola, had already developed a working concept for a quantum computer. Their ideas were triggered by a talk given by Arthur Eckert during the 14th International Conference on Atomic Physics in 1995, which was organized by David Weinland and Carl Wieman. Eckert presented the concept of quantum computing and how wonderful it would be if they could build one. Given Sirax and Zoller's experience with ion traps, they quickly thought how this could be done. A crucial part was missing. That was the quantum gate. After several attempts, they came up with an idea that became famous as the Zirak Zoller gate. I will not try to explain that to you. That I leave to the experts, Flore Kunst and Ignacio Zirak. They will explore with you some basics of quantum physics, quantum computers, and in the end, the relevance of the proposal in 1995, back then and today. Let's start with the first question. This is for both of you, but let's start with Flora. Why did you choose this career? Why quantum optics? Yeah, so thank you for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, so uh, I think quantum mechanics first, so quantum mechanics, which, I mean, quantum optics is just quantum mechanics for light. Uh, it first got my attention when I started studying physics, so in my bachelor's, and it grasped me because all the concepts of quantum mechanics are so different from what we know from the world around us, basically by moving in it every day. You know, when you grow up, you sort of subconsciously already learn about laws of physics because if you walk against the wall, you can't go through it, right? It hurts, or if you push against the table, it moves. And these kinds of things you already learn when growing up. And this is, of course, classical mechanics. It's Newtonian physics. And to me, when I first learned about quantum mechanics, there's so many new concepts. Uh, and that really got my attention uh, at first. So what about you? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a similar story. So in my case, I liked uh, a lot of mathematics. I like philosophy, but I like uh, also engineering. And so that's a combination that it's very hard to match together in any study. And however, it turns out that quantum physics uh, unites all these three. So first of all, it's a new theory for nature, and it tells us that the nature, the things that we see, are very different from what we can imagine. And so it has concepts that are go beyond physics, I would say, and is touch more philosophy. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the theory that describes quantum physics is a very mathematical theory, it's a beautiful mathematical theory, and so I like it very much as well. And the third part is that it has applications. So at the time when I was studying, it was not clear that it had the applications that we know so far. 
but it's something that can be used to build something and therefore that's why when I first uh, was introduced to quantum physics, it was in my third year of physics in mm -hmm. 1985, 86, then I fell in love with that and I continue doing that for all my life till now. Yeah, so, so what, what is the aspect of quantum physics that you, you like most or that you find that it's like strange or that it's like calling your attention more? Yeah, so I was actually thinking about this also preparing for today and I think one thing that has always grabbed my attention and that really speaks to the imagination is maybe very basic is the double slit experiment, mm -hmm. right? So there you can... Uh, both see sort of the particle wave duality of light comes out there. So if you shine light at a, I, don't know, this is, I guess a system which is two-dimensional, there are two slits in it, you shine a laser at it, then you would observe at, uh, behind it, if you look on the wall, you would see an interference spectrum, right? Which then shows you the wave uh, aspect of light. But if you now put uh, photon uh, detectors at these slits, so light, if you think of it in terms of particles, it constitutes of photons, and you would then sort of start to measure when, where does the photon pass, then you actually don't really see the interference pattern anymore, right? So I think this aspect of quantum mechanics where the results or things that you see change when you observe or don't observe, I think that is extremely fascinating, and it's still, I still can't entirely wrap my head around this concept that you, we can actually see this in a lab, right, that this happens. And, so that for me, yeah, I, I sometimes still can sort of put that together to really understand how that happens. Yeah, so in a sense this is, this is a very <coughs> weird aspect of quantum mm -hmm. physics that when we don't observe, something exactly. kind of behaves different than when we observe. Mm -hmm. And so we are used to the, to the fact that when we say that I see a chair somewhere, then the chair is there, and even if I don't look at it, the chair should be there. Yeah. But in quantum physics it's not true. When I don't observe the position, the properties of the chair start to be defuminating. It's not defined, it's not that we don't know, it's not defined. And that's really deep. So the fact that the observed world behaves different than the non-observed world is something that is very weird and it crashes against many concepts, I guess, in philosophy as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's also, I think many physicists, quantum physicists are also very interested in philosophy, I think, especially because of that, because it puts a lot of questions indeed of how do we see the world, right? And uh, yeah, I think that's an absolutely fascinating uh, aspect all of all of this, and I think also this already, I think, naturally leads us even to quantum computers, right? Because there you make use of these properties exactly to speed up computations. No, that, that's right. So somehow the, you look at history. So first the. Uh, when people develop quantum theory in order to explain phenomena and then they were able to explain, they saw that they have to pay a price for that. So you believe that the theory that works very, very well is really true, consistent, then you should also believe this aspect about nature. And yeah. at the beginning, all these um, famous scientists, uh, Einstein and Schrodinger and so many other people found that there should be something wrong. I mean, this, this concept should be wrong. However, then as technology developed and developed and developed, and I mean, it turned out that we could check that, and we can, mm -hmm. as you say, we can observe this, and we can check that the, the nature is so weird. And so, what happened, like uh, I guess in many fields before, is that a concept that that's really something strange, and then you investigate, then all of a sudden you realize that since this is strange, then it has an application. You can do with that something that you cannot do with anything else. Mm -hmm. And I guess that quantum computing is one of the examples of that. No? I mean, you, you have something that is very weird, you start understanding it, then maybe you can use it. I mean, a quantum computer actually this, this concept of the fact that things are not defined when we don't look at them, that things can do two things at the same time when we are not looking at them, then, or many things at the same time, it's, it's exploited by quantum computers. Yeah. Yeah, so that I find that it's extremely fascinating, this, this aspect. and. Um, so like you said, indeed, when quantum mechanics was developed, it was very debated. I think even Max Planck mm -hmm. himself mm -hmm. was also a big part of this uh, story, of course. Um, but I think, I mean, the qu people working on quantum mechanics, they uh, at some point did start to accept these mm -hmm. ideas, right? I mean, they came up with a way to interpret. Um, of course, it really shakes your beliefs. And indeed, if you really believe that the theory really is how the world works, then it can be quiet. Uh, strange when you first get introduced uh, to the world of quantum mechanics. Um, but I think that 
uh, yeah, this is of course also what makes it very interesting. And so um, just to come back to the quantum computers, because so the first idea or sort of the idea of a quantum computer was came up was sort of um, introduced by Richard Feynman, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm correct, in 1982 where he said nature is quantum mechanical and therefore we need a quantum mechanical device to simulate nature. Um, but then it took you till 2000, or sorry, not 2000, 1995, mm -hmm. to come up with the first idea, right? To how to implement a quantum computer. Uh, so that is still quite some time between the first thought of this concept until you came up with this idea. Well, if you look, if you look back, actually, uh, uh, Feynman was a visionary, mm -hmm. not only in quantum <laughs> computing, but in <laughs> many, many other fields. I mean, yes. considered also to be a visionary in nanotechnology. And, mm -hmm. But at that time, so if you read this paper that you mentioned in 1982, it was really visionary. So he realized that um, you have to use something that is quantum, but in his paper, he describes how a quantum computer would, would work. Mm -hmm. So he says very explicitly, so let's, I mean, first of all, let's cut time in small pieces, yeah. okay, so discretize time, yeah, yeah. and let's discretize also space. So you have a table that is continuous, let's just make like small pieces, and in each of the pieces, then let's put one bit, quantum bit. Mm -hmm. and so he was defining already quantum bits, yeah, yeah. and he was saying, so if we want to do something with that, then we should do this, this quantum bits, you know, that we call qubits, mm -hmm. should interact with each other, and he defined what we call quantum gates, and so on. So in this paper, there was a definition of a quantum computer, basically as we understand it now. Because nobody took at that time uh, this, this field. Not clear that, that quantum physics, that these predictions of quantum physics were true. This, uh, I mean, the mm -hmm. fact that mm -hmm. uh, things are not let's say, uh, defined. And there was the first experiment of ASPE at the time. And so there were people testing. And uh, during the next year, so there were people who caught the idea and started thinking, so if this something like that, a quantum computer exists, so could we do something with that that we can do with other systems? Yeah. And then there were papers showing that this is indeed, this was possible. However, they were very academic paper, mm -hmm. papers. So they were, there was not uh, really an application that would change, let's say, um, everything. However, the, 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 Later on, there was in 1994, there was a paper by Peter Shore yeah. in which he showed yeah, yeah, yeah. that indeed there was something that a quantum computer could do and this could make a big impact, a huge impact in society. This was this factorization paper that was actually very well, uh, I mean, was not very well known at that time, but I think that this is what motivated many of us, including myself and yeah. Peter Zoller, to start thinking that, okay, so this... Uh, abstract concept of a quantum computer could be, if we can just make it, I mean build it, then it could be useful for something. And yeah. that's why we started and some other people started thinking of how to build it at that time, in the 95. So you're talking about Shor's algorithm, right, which is the vectorization of numbers. So, uh, which is basically, if you have an integer number, you want to see what prime numbers it uh, consists of or it factori factorize it. So what would this actually be useful for, right? I mean cryptology probably or things like this? Well, this was the first example mm -hmm. where there was something useful and this uh, useful would be, to, would be for decrypting messages. So yeah. all the messages that are encrypted nowadays, so whenever we use any cryptographic system at home, internet, when we buy something per internet, yeah. this is encrypted and the fact that classical computers cannot factorize efficiently is exactly. what gives us security. Yeah. And at that time, people realized that the quantum computer could factorize much faster and therefore the security of encryption would be in, in danger. Mm -hmm. And that was the first one. Of course, it's not the nicest application <laughs> that you could imagine, no? but it was the first one. So people realized that indeed the quantum computer could do something. And this was like the, what uh, started like yeah. the, the race. Yeah. And then after that, there were some other applications that people have found. Mm -hmm. But I think that it was very important to, to, to see that. And, and, and and also what happened in 95 is that then right away when we made this proposal then there was an experiment at the right at Wynet and mm -hmm. Chris Monroe and some other people mm -hmm. who demonstrated the basic principle that we had proposed so there was a demonstration and that's why people gain I mean, uh, people gain confidence that this could be a path towards yeah. quantum computing yeah because since then we've come a long way i mean google just mm -hmm published at the end of last year a uh, very big results, right, where they uh, implement a quantum computer. So I thought before we move on, though, we should maybe, because you already mentioned the word quantum bit or yeah. qubit, 
uh, these are the basic constituents of a quantum computer, right? So uh, a qubit is a quantum version of a bit, right? So zero or one, except that it's quantum, so it's both at the same time in a way. So could you maybe t explain a little bit more also about, so a qubit in itself can appear in many different physical realizations, mm -hmm. right? So the one you propose in your paper would be in ions, mm -hmm. so you, where you have a ground state and an excited state. But the one that Google, for example, used uh, very recently, they make use of superconducting qubits. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you could... Yeah, so, so for the moment, they have, there are many technologies that are being developed in order to build a quantum computer, and there are some of them that are relatively advanced, and these are ion traps, superconducting yeah. qubits, and some other ones, and some other ones that are not advanced at the moment, but maybe in the next year they advance a lot and surpass the ones that we have. And so what is nice about quantum computing is like classical computer. You can develop an algorithm. They are this based on bits and how you manipulate bits, in the quantum case, quantum bits, qubits. But it's independent. It works independent of the what is the implementation. It's like if you buy a computer, it's a PC or it's an Apple or it's something. Yeah. It works in the same way, right? I mean, the base, it doesn't matter how what is made of. And in the case of a quantum computer, the similar thing. So the theory is valid for all of them, yeah. but the way that you do it in practice may differ from one to another one. And the one that we proposed was based on atoms. So you mm -hmm. would store these two states of a bit, mm -hmm. I mean, like like the like the zero and the one, yes, in something that could be thought of a, of, of a, like a magnet. So the atoms are like little magnets, yeah. you know, and. Uh, so they have what is called a, a dark, dipole moment, a magnetic dipole moment, and this magnet can be pointing up. The, the north pole is pointing up, or the north pole is pointing down. That's a one and a zero. And that's how we were proposing how to I mean, store these qubits. But since they are quantum particles, then they can be in the superpositions in both of them at the same exactly. time. Yeah. And uh, so then you can manipulate it with lasers. What we propose is how using lasers then you can create the superposition, you can create the gates that Feynman was proposing, and in this way, building a quantum computer, you have many of them. The one that Google has is, is based on circuits, so you have very small circuits, and one can imagine that in the circuit there is current going on, and the current can go like clockwise, <laughs> or the current can go counterclockwise, so that you can store zero in the clockwise current, and one in the counterclockwise, and since this circuit is extremely small, they obey the laws of quantum physics, and then you can have them in superposition, they can do the same two things at the same time. And so people have figured out how you put many of those qubits together, then also you can make them interact to logic gates, and in that way perform any computation that a quantum computer could perform. Yeah. So I think, especially uh, like what you're saying right now, right, you're in a superposition, so each bit basically you can be up or down mm -hmm. or one, zero, one. But of course, Google, they had 53 qubits, mm -hmm. so then you have two to the power of 53 different combinations, so to say, if you read it out okay. of states that you can be in. So that, I think, already illustrates the enormous computing power of such a system versus if mm -hmm. you have 53 bits, I guess, in a classical. Uh, computer. So one thing I was actually wondering is that most proposals for quantum computers, they're based on qubits, mm -hmm. right? So zero, one. Yeah. But there's also some ideas of, you know, in principle in quantum mechanics, you can have more than two mm -hmm. levels, so yeah. to say. So these are known as qubits, right? Yeah. Where then you have d uh, different levels that you could be in. So are there actually proposals to realize quantum computers in such setups? Because then you could have even stronger computation power. Yes, perhaps. yes, yes. I mean, there are proposals. The only thing is that they only give a factor. Mm -hmm. They don't change the efficiency of your yeah. computer. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have four level systems. Yeah. So I don't know, that's right, it's, I don't know how they <laughs> compute. Um, before, like, like instead of zero, one, you have zero, one, two, three, and yeah. superpositions they're off. Then, if you need to build a quantum computer with 100 qubits, then you only need 50 of those. Yeah. And you can do exactly the same things of 50. Yeah. So you gain these factors of two, but the factor of two I mean, may not be as, as, as much because you will have to deal with these four-level systems that are more difficult to deal with. And that's why people first they concentrate on, mm -hmm. on, on qubits. And it's similar in classical, in classical mm -hmm. computation. In classical computation, you could also work with qubits or... or, or Classical <laughs> bits, bits, or whatever they are called, 
and uh, and then um, it will be more efficient but there is a payoff there is a balance yeah. and maybe the more difficult to deal with and that's why people at the end use bits and i think it's very similar yeah exactly it. so it just comes down basically to a hardware problem then and then yeah yeah, yeah. If, it's, if it's just a well for the first for the first for these first prototypes that google and, and uh, many people at the end but also mm -hmm. people are uh, right uh, chris monroe and many 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 people i shouldn't mention anybody because i'm forgetting <laughs> many. they because if they are able to on the order of 50 qubits each of them, 100 qubits, then of course maybe they can gain a factor of two, which makes a big difference just by using some other internal levels. I'm sure that they are thinking about that and that they will they probably use it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um so actually the concept of quantum computers, right? So before maybe we go a bit more into detail about what in your proposal that you did made 25 years ago, maybe we can talk a little bit about what is it going to bring us, mm -hmm. all right? So mm -hmm. right now everyone has a laptop at home, even a smartphone is a small computer. So what about quantum computers? Will we have quantum computers in our house? Uh, well, I cannot imagine <laughs> that we will have quantum computers. And the reason is because the uh, task that a laptop, classical laptop, desktop does already, and uh, it's, it's enough for us. I mean, you, what do you do at home? You have to write emails, you have to look at that, something up in the internet, and maybe the tax declaration, and <laughs> that's a class, a class, a classical computer, it's, it's good enough for that. So the quantum computers at the moment are thought for a very big calculation, things that the normal people don't, don't, don't use, like uh, computations for design of some drugs or for material, or for some optimization problem that the uh, industry may need, something mm -hmm. like that, and not for particular problems. But the other thing we were discussing, you remember that we were saying that, that, that one can never say anything like that. Also, 50 years ago, I mean, people developed the first computers, then they could not imagine that they would, be, that they would have personal computers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so maybe something like that happens. So what I am sure is that as soon as these quantum computers, like the ones that have been built, are evolving and evolving and evolving, then uh, they will more applications, more use cases will be found because then you I mean you see what is the power, and then you people I mean entrepreneurs and somebody start developing ideas, and mm -hmm. I guess that this will happen as well. Yeah. So I think if, so. Also to dive into that a little bit. So I mean. To be able to make a program for a quantum computer, one needs to have quite a very solid knowledge of quantum mechanics, right? So right now, if people want to learn computer science, they learn how to work with classical computers. Do you think that maybe in the future universities will offer programs where you actually learn quantum computing specifically? Oh, yes, yes. Well, I mean, this is happening. Of course, this, this, this is, is, this is, this is, this is <laughs> happening. And, and, and some universities in, here in Munich, for example, mm -hmm. now we are going to start a master on quantum science and technology. It's yeah. not only quantum computation, but uh, I mean, uh, there are other fields where quantum physics can also help. I mean, this kind of uh, weird uh, properties of quantum physics can also help not, also, no. not only to speed up uh, some computational process, but also in communication and so on. And so we're starting a master here. Yeah. And there are studies in many other places in the US, in engineering and so on. So I think that that's the beginning of this um, revolution that now is um, revolutionizing science. It will revolutionize at some point industry as well, but also education, because I guess that at some point people, engineers, will need quantum physics or to, 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 to be able to build quantum computers. Yeah. 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 So what is the what is the the, the the application that is more fascinating for you for a quantum computer? For a quantum computer, oh, I find that very hard actually as a question because I think right now, I mean, uh, I would think more in terms of understanding physics better. Mm -hmm. So I think I mean we also already talked about this before that Google in their experiment they used to say okay look now we know quantum mechanics still works mm -hmm. at this level of fifty three qubits. And I think that already says something because that means that there are many unexplored uh, directions one can still go in, right? Because now only we, I mean, we can do experiments for still relatively small systems if you think about it. Um, so I think for me, the quantum computers, the fact that they can simulate um, problems or sort of open problems in physics, I think that for me personally is what makes it most exciting, these developments. 
It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think that yeah. many scientists would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably and people in the industry would not really yeah. find that so exciting. But, it's, yeah. but it, it was the same with the development of like the sort of classical computer, right? I mean, it was a huge machine back in the day. And it was I, they used it at NASA to to compute yeah. trajectories and, and things like this. And so I think in, also that in the beginning was very much used also for scientific purposes. Yeah. And I guess then. Well, there is a general circle, um, circu circu circular argument. Note that uh, uh, when you advance science, mm -hmm. with this science, you will develop technology, and with the technology, allows you to cross frontiers, discover new science, and with this new science, you discover the technology, <laughs> and so on. Yeah. So that also makes sense that also quantum computers could be used you know, to advance science, and this uh, you know, go through the circle. Yeah, because what you so one uh, concept that is very important for of course for quantum computers is quantum entanglement. Mm -hmm. So um, I was thinking, so maybe we can also talk a little bit about that because I think entanglement is a word you hear quite a lot in this context. So entanglement is of course this concept that two particles are somehow connected to each other such that you can never, if you learn something about one particle, you immediately know something about an, another particle. That's a very simple way of saying it. So say I have an electron that is entangled with another electron, one is spin up, one spin down. Of course we don't know, and I, I give you one and then I measure what spin mine has, then you immediately know, or we immediately know what spin your particle has, right? So this plays a very important role for quantum computing, so I thought maybe you could explain a little bit why this is actually so important. <laughs> Yes, yes, so that's, a, that's a, 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 a property. I mean, you mentioned before that if we have a qubit, mm -hmm. one qubit can do two things at the same time, it can be a zero and a one in a quantum computer. We use the fact that you can have superpositions in order to speed up the yes. process. If you have two qubits, it can do four things at the same time, exactly. right? Because it can be either two I mean, zeros, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, three qubits can do eight, 16, so on. So n qubits can do two to the power n, and that's part of what why a quantum computer has this uh, kind of power because it's exploiting these superpositions and doing things, many things at the same time. And it turns out that this, uh, these superpositions, or well, this general proposition that, I mean, that, uh, that the quantum computer is using, possess kind of a lot of entanglement. Mm -hmm. So they have to have the property that you just mentioned. So one can very easily understand that if they are never entangled, you have qubits and they are never entangled, then you they will not have any speed up. So entanglement seems to be one of the fuel of a quantum computer. Mm -hmm. Now, as, as you mentioned also, this uh, entanglement reflects, I mean, you cannot see it directly so much in quantum computation. It's there and it's required, but you cannot see it. But you can see it in some other applications. I mean, the fact that by observing one particle, then you define this property, but not only this property of this particle, but also one that can be as far as you, I mean, as it is, so it defines mm, the property of both particles just by looking at one of them. Yeah. This, of course, has, has many applications, and I mean, one of them is in, in cryptography because you could imagine that in, in this way people can use that in a sophisticated way to communicate with each other in such a way that no information goes through any means, so the information somehow disappears from a place and appears on the other place without going through. There have to be some signals, okay, because you cannot violate causality, you cannot send information at the speed faster of light, but these signals don't contain any information so nobody can find out. Yeah, that is actually quite fascinating. I mean, this is, people are also using these kinds of entanglement, right, to know if someone has been eavesdropping, for example, mm -hmm. because then you, would, you can sort of measure or know that someone has been observing your particle, so to say, or the information coming in. Um, so, uh, we already mentioned that Google uses qubits to realize the quantum system. In your proposal, you use uh, ions, mm -hmm. and but there are other ways mm -hmm. of, of realizing quantum computers as well, right? So I thought maybe. Could yeah. Okay, so we can, can talk about uh, the. I would say that most advanced at the moment would be these uh, ions, the, the superconducting qubits. Then there are also neutral atoms. Mm -hmm. So that's. Uh, so these are not ions. Ions are atoms in which you have taken out an electron and therefore they're positive charge and so they repel each other and that's why you can hold them and they don't get close to each other. So you can also have something similar. You have atoms 
that are neutral, that you mm -hmm. don't have not extracted any electron. And in this case, you have to levitate them, you have to isolate them, you have to levitate them, and you can do that with lasers, actually. Our institute is uh, it's one of the let's say, prominent places where people do experiments <laughs> with that. Exactly. And, and now, with, this, with these atoms that are not uh, charged, then they can, uh, you need to talk to each other, you need to create the superpositions. They also have these magnets, like the ions, mm -hmm. and now in order to talk to, to each other, then you can, you can use the fact that the, the electrons I mean, make orbits. And so if these orbits are very big, then they can see each other and they talk to each other. And that's how, in a way in which they are building quantum computers based on, on called Rydberg atoms. Another possibility are photons. Okay, so the, the, the photons, and you see when you have light, like the one that is coming here, you know that it's made out of small particles. And these, uh, these particles have also something like, like a magnet, that they call polarization, okay? So they can have this property that is pointing up or pointing to one side, and it's called, called this polarization. And then you can store a qubit there, and people are trying to build quantum computers with that. They're also in, in solid state physics, in, in solids, not in not flying away, <laughs> in, in uh, semiconductors, uh, so you can have uh, quantum dots. And so these are little traps inside a solid where you can trap a single electron. And this electron again has this, mag this magnet. And so then you can store a qubit, and so people are doing quantum computers with that. Or you can implant an atom also in a solid. And if you implant it and you put another atom uh, aside, it's like if you have these atoms levitating in space but now are in the solid. Mm -hmm. And so that's another way that people are trying to build quantum computers. So, I mean, we know different ways in which people are doing that. Some of them are more advanced, some of them are not so advanced. But it's not clear yet what will be the winning technology. So what, when we have a, a scalable quantum computer, it will be made out of probably none of these technologies. There will be some <laughs> other technology that will, at the end, uh, win the race. Yeah, so because, if, for example, for the, if you look at photos of what the lab looked like that Google used, for example, for their teeny tiny chip with 23, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, so Q, or if you have superconducting qubits, you need to perform these experiments at very low temperatures. I think they did it for Kelvins, if I remember correctly. So anyway, in that ballpark, so it's very, very, very cold. Um, so all of the different implementations of quantum computers and qubits they have similar experimental obstacles, right? That's right. So the, the obstacle is that in a quantum computer you have a qubit, then you're using, exploiting the superpositions, but you cannot look at it. Mm -hmm. right? Because if you look at it, then it disappears and you yeah. define the property. So it's not only that you can look at it or that I cannot look at it. Uh, I mean, uh, Katerina cannot look at it. But also, if there is a dog that cannot look at it, so nothing can look at it, even a molecule cannot look at it, it has to be completely isolated from everything else. And that's the main problem. You have to isolate the systems, and to isolate is very difficult. And in superconducting qubits, I mean, you have to cool down to very, very low temperature in such a way that nothing moves, mm -hmm. and this is where it's operating. In the case of trap ions, they are at room temperature in principle, so they don't need to cool down, but still you have to get rid of all the molecules that are around mm -hmm. and, uh, and have them in very special conditions. So in all these implementations, they have to be very extreme conditions, and this is why it makes it difficult to build them and it's more special, more than building and to scale them up. So the more particles, the more qubits you want to put together, the more difficult it is to isolate them. And that's why they have, uh, I mean, that's, that's a big challenge. So how to scale all mm -hmm. these systems up, but keeping these properties, these quantum mechanical properties. Yeah, so that, that I guess also brings us a little bit to the idea of how do you, when you program a quantum computer, right? When you, I mean, it's in a quantum state, but still you want to get information out. So in the end, you need to observe it. You need to measure, right? right. So, so how how does that work? Because you you come up with a, a program, you make use of the quantum properties, but yet at the beginning and at the end, you revert back to observing. You are in basically sort of in a classical way. So, so how do people? About this. Yeah, that's right. So that's one of the contradictions of the quantum computer. It has to be isolated, but if it's isolated, you cannot read it, you <laughs> cannot see it, you cannot get any information. So at some point, you will have to look at it and to measure. And so what happens is that the algorithms, the quantum algorithms, are built so that at the beginning, you have a very well-defined state, so all your particles are in zero, like in a pocket calculator, that at the end is zero, you raise the state. <laughs> and then you do something, there are all these superpositions in the, in the middle, and at the very end, the algorithm is such that, that the solution is well-defined there, so you just have to look at it. So you, I mean, you don't uh, say define any property, because it's already with that property, it's, it, has a, it has. 
And so there, uh, the way that this happens in practice depends on the implementation. In the case yeah. of the trap atoms, what happens is that with, uh, you can shine light on these ions and it turns out that if the magnet is point out, then the light goes through and doesn't do anything. Whereas if it's pointing up, then the light is scattered and mm -hmm. it goes in all directions. So you look that there is light coming out from your ion, then you know that it's in one. <laughs> if there is no light, there is a zero. And in this way, you can look at each of your ions and then at the end read the state 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, etc. And this gives you the solution to your problem. Um, so how does this make use, full use of, of the quantum properties? Because uh, in the end, you know, your system is in a superposition, it's entangled, it can be anything, but then you measure and then you get a solution. How does the solution capture the quantumness of what you well, did? Well, in, 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 for a good algorithm, it doesn't. Yeah. It's gone. So it's all intermediate. So you, let's say, you start with a classical state, and all well everything will define. You end up with a classical state because this is what you want to read, that's the information. Yeah, yeah. But in between, you're using to speed up the process how to get from the initial state to the final state, you're using these superpositions in a very clever way that if you would not use these superpositions, it would be difficult or impossible to go from this initial state to the final yeah. state. So that's why it's very difficult to develop a quantum algorithm because you have to find a way how from let's say, everything zeros, I mean, then you can get something that solves a problem and you have to make sure that at the end you don't have a huge <laughs> superposition because when you measure you will get a random number. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, so this I guess also it's a bit of a question in the end of um, what people call the quantum advantage or, or even a step further would be quantum supremacy, right? That the idea is that in the end, the quantum computer gives us a possibility to do something that much faster than a classical computer, that that is in the end why we want to use it, right? Because I guess, like you said, in the end, what you put in and what you get out is still classical. And that's, of course, also the case with the classical computer. So, but the time skills are, I mean, can be yes. very different, right? I mean, Google was a couple of nanoseconds versus that thousands of years, at least in the end. Yes. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So at the end, I mean, the very, very famous physicists were saying information is classical. Yeah. So when people talk about quantum information, and information is classical. At the end, you want zeros and one, and your brain uses zeros <laughs> and ones and not superposition. So, but what happens in between? It's what can be quantum, what quantum can help. Yeah. And indeed, this is what happens. I mean, maybe at some point, we don't know, but there's a modern application that uses the quantum in, I mean, the fact that you're one. But, but I mean, for the moment, there is no, no uh, hint that yeah. there will be something like that. Yeah. Yes, so maybe we can talk also a little bit more specifically about the uh, paper that was published exactly 25 mm -hmm. years ago, right? Where you and, and Good together with Peter Seller came up with an idea. So you already mentioned your idea was based on trapped ions. So then you use lasers to capture ions. I think this technique in itself is already quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, so yeah. perhaps you can do Yeah, so at the time, uh, people were working with trap ions to build atomic clocks. So these are the yeah. most precise clocks that exist. And then they uh, started uh, just use uh, yes, uh, the difficulty is that since these ions are charged, yeah. because we have taken out an electron, it means that they uh, react to electric fields. So you put some electrodes then yeah. the electrons will push this yeah. ion. And actually this is what they use in order to levitate them. Okay? Yeah. So they get rid of all the air that is mm -hmm. around it to mm -hmm. the vacuum. And then they put these electrodes and plant one of these ions. Yeah. And then it starts moving. And there is also a technology, it was developed at that time, that to cool these ions. So these ions are moving very fast actually. The ions are moving at the speed of uh, like an airplane is moving, you know, <laughs> really. And then, but with a laser actually you can stop them. And yeah. then once you have stopped them, then is where you can start thinking of a qubit. Yeah. And then is where you, with a laser, you can manipulate, create these superpositions. And also at the time, what we thought of is that in order to do gates, we could use the fact that they have Coulomb interactions. So mm -hmm. depending on, if you move one ion, then the other ion will move. Actually, all the ions will move, yeah. so you move one. All the ions move. Yeah. And in this way, they can interact. So you can do gates between pairs of ions. This is what we call a phonon. There is a phonon bus yeah. that it's transporting like the information from one ion to the other ion. And in this way, you can make the logic gates that are required for, for uh, the, to build the quantum computer, plus the, the, the mesh, I mean, the, the, the readout that I mentioned before, and, mm -hmm. and also the preparation. So you can, I mean, you want for a quantum computer, you want to raise 
what is at the beginning, you know, it's like in a pocket calculator, what at the beginning to start with zero, and you calculate, <laughs> you don't want to start with 47,000 something, <laughs> no? so that then, so all these things have to be put in that, in that paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was quite a revolutionary paper at the time. I can imagine I was only four years old. So <laughs> obviously, I don't remember. But uh, do did people? I mean, this idea was also realized at some point in an experiment, right? And is it still being used today? Or I mean, I suppose people have also maybe perhaps already built on this and developed it further. Um, well, the, the ion trap, the ion trap uh, quantum computer is, is developed in several yeah. universities, and and there are companies building it. Okay, so that's really developed. Now, the way they do it in practice is not in the same way as we originally mm -hmm. envisioned. Some mm -hmm. parts of the computer, yes, but some of them have been perfection and there are now better ways of uh, doing something like that. But yes, I would say that that's the pursuit and that there, there are, I mean, I don't know how many ion traps quantum computer in the world, but I don't know, 10, 20, 30 or something like that. That's quite and a that, number. Yeah, yeah. But that, that is actually quite amazing, you know, that this idea that you had 25 years ago is I mean, still being used today and basically created an avalanche, I would say, of different proposals. In yes, this. but I have to give credit to the experimentalists <laughs> for that. Yeah, so the yeah, fact yeah. that the idea was there, it's nice, but the experimentalists were able to do it in practice. And so I think that it was because of the push of the experimentalists that it took over and also triggered ideas from some other people. So people started thinking, oh, maybe we can do it with that, we can do it with that, or with photos, or with superconducting, and so on. So I guess that it, I mean, the fact that experimentalists were able to show it triggered also yeah. Interesting developments. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we could speak about this infinitely, <laughs> but uh, I think it's time to throw some questions in. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I will start with the most concrete. Um, you guys were talking about qubits, so uh, a question was: How do you manipulate qubits in order to make them, uh, in order to make real calculations? Whoever wants to elaborate <laughs> on that. <laughs> Well, I, I, my, your knowledge is much more specific on this than mine, but yeah, I guess one way of, like you already said, is you can perhaps shine a laser and then you can already influence uh, what way the qubit behaves. Uh, like you said already, for super connectivity, you can make use of the direction in which the current goes, but I would say it depends very much on the setup. Uh, that you use to build a quantum computer and how you manipulate them, but you probably have more well, details. Well, it depends on yeah. you know, right? So it depends on the technology. So yeah. with superconducting devices, they use more fluxes, so flux yeah. of the magnetic yeah. field, in yeah. order to change the direction of the current. And it's a much more sophisticated than what we are saying. <laughs> now, and with the, we're trying to, <laughs> to to say it in a level that the physici non physicists could could some kind kind of grasp mm -hmm. it or. Mm -hmm. In the case of, of uh, quantum dots, uh, they, they do it with uh, some um, electrodes and some mm -hmm. magnetic fields. Also, they change the, the magnetic field will change these magnets yeah, so yeah, it's exactly, moving. Yeah. And in the case of, of photons, they can also do some of these gates, putting some lambda plates or just going through some material. And going through some material, these are special materials which change the polarization. Mm -hmm. So depending on the on the technology, we can use different 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 ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the next question is about the wave-particle dualism. So, um, why does it always happen in the double-slit experiment that when you observe a particle, that it makes it observed as a particle and not observing makes it a probability wave? Um, is that due to the human senses or what's the reason for this? That's quite it. Yeah. <laughs> You see, I mean, I, I have a little bit of a problem understanding this kind of duality. Okay, so for me, the quantum, I mean, this was, this was a language that was used uh, 50 years ago when it, and they didn't grasp the, but now it's more that the state is not defined. And then if it's not defined, it's kind of superposed doing things. And when you observe, it stops doing that. So you need, if you measure, then you observe, then you define it, and then you understand what is happening. So more than duality, I would say that there is the unobserved part in which you have these superpositions, the particles are doing many things at the same time, and whenever you observe, then you define them, and then of course, then, I mean, at, at that moment it behaves in a different way. But this kind of duality and all ways of probability that people talk, I mean, sometimes I have a hard time to understand what they mean. Yeah, yeah I suppose, I guess, the particle wave duality does translate a bit into observing versus not observing. And I guess this is still a difficult concept to grasp. 
in, mm -hmm. in a way. I mean, but you even already said for the quantum computer, you cannot have a dog looking at it either, or even another molecule. So I guess that already defines what an observer would be. In, uh, although, I guess if you do the double split experiment, yeah. you could still see the wave. Yeah, so the, a little bit the problem with this wave is that what is a wave of what? I mean, a wave is made out of something. It's an electric field, electromagnetic field. <laughs> yeah. is a wave of uh, sound or something like that. Mm. This wave of probability, I mean, for me, it's a bit... Uh, uh, we can, I don't. I mean, that's not the language that I use for for quantum physics. But I mean, I guess that people may have a better intuition for that, and that's why they use that. Mm -hmm. What do you use? <laughs> Which well, language? Uh, the, well, the, this language of uh, superpositions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the fact that a, a power particle can be in different states and can be in superpositions of the state at the, at the same time. It doesn't have to be a, a wave, uh, I mean, a particle. I mean, that's what we understand. It's something that we need to have a detector makes click. Okay? So it's, it's, that's what we call a particle. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, uh, brings us right to the next question, um, with superposition being a plurality of several uh, options. Um, can we truly understand the nature of reality, in your opinion? It's not what's like. And that's a very philosophical question, I would say, right? So, um, I would say, I, I actually don't really know a definite answer to that. I mean, I guess we do live in a classical world, so we're constantly observing. So, I, I guess at the level that we live, so to say, this maybe, at least I don't think this plays a role. But there are some people I would say that disagree probably on this. Uh, I don't know what your... <laughs> Well, I mean, it's like everything. If you get used to that, it's not surprising. So uh, why should things be defined when you don't observe them? Because, I mean, we tend to imagine that they should be defined. Mm. Oh, the moon is there even if I don't observe it. Okay, yeah. But why should it be like that? No? It's a little bit the uh, concept. And there's no contradiction with anything that we see, because whenever I look at it, it's there. So, yeah. so yeah. whenever you observe, it's defined. So the fact that things are not defined I mean, it's not, it's not so contradictory, it's not so, it's not so, it's not understandable, not understanding, that's how nature is. What is a little bit uh, uh, more disturbing, I guess, is, uh, so, why is that? So, or why uh, things are in this particular way? Or, for example, when does it happen? Does it happen when I am observing, when I perceive it, when it's, uh, so the talk comes there? And I mean, there are all these questions, and there's a lot of philosophy and a lot of theories and multi universes and uh, cubism and something which will have different interpretations for something like that. And then I invite the uh, people who are watching this that tend to have a look at the internet <laughs> and to see the different interpretations for quantum physics, which are very entertaining, very interesting. <laughs> um, uh, however, I, I don't believe that there is a problem of uh, understanding, it's more mm. accepting that yeah. things are like that. Huh? But I guess the question, even because here the question was really about reality, but I guess, I mean, the, the question of what is reality is not even so easy to answer anyway. Uh, so, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right that it, at least it doesn't contradict how we view the world. But one could, of course, think of what it de does mean of, of how we observe the world. But yeah, like you said, there's many different interpretations and theories that exist for people to in, who interpret quantum mechanics in a philosophical, philosophical way to see what it means for us. Yeah. I have another question uh, about entanglement. Um, does any current particle have an entangled counterpart? And if yes, do all particles in a certain system have entangled counterparts in such a way that they appear as a counter system? So it's, it's, uh, so it's not a one-to-one -one particle. It's not that two particles are entangled and they are paired. I mean, a particle can be entangled with many particles. Uh, there is a monogamy of entanglement, which means that you can be either very entangled to one particle or little entangled with many particles. The more particles, the less entangled. Okay, that's the monogamy. But that's what happens in practice. So, I mean, I'm sure that in this table and wherever, the particles are all entangled with each other. However, very, very, very little entangled because they have to share this, uh, this kind of property with many and therefore they can give a little bit to each of them only. Uh, so there's not that there is a counter particle that's entangled. There are many, many, basically all the other particles that are little entangled with that one. Yeah, nothing to add to that. 
Well, I think we've answered all the questions, so I will throw in one myself um, on quantum computers. Um, why now? So um, why are we observing um, this development now? So the, the physics world is talking quantum for 100 years now. They're talking quantum computers 25 years now. Now the public is talking about it and we make those advancements in technologies. Why is it happening now? What has changed? That's a very good question. So, in fact, uh, quantum physics is for a very long time. The problem is that the uh, technology that is required in order to build a quantum computer is very complex because you have to isolate these particles and uh, so far it was very difficult. So actually the first experiments where they were able to see these kind of weird particles, I mean the, the weird properties of the particles uh, occurred in the 70s and, and beginning of the 80s. And since then all the, te the technology has been progressing. At the beginning was in order to observe the phenomenon, in order to understand it, but then in order to improve, 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 and it took some time. And I think that uh, uh, now it's when we arrive there, and it has. I mean, the fact that we are now there is because, on the one hand, the research that experimentalists did in many places in the world, and on the other hand, I think that the industry has also pushed the subject. I mean, IBM, Google, Intel. I mean, you name it. I mean, there, there are many companies that put a lot of effort, and this is. Mm, means that there is some, some I mean, more funding for that. There is also the industry pushing. And on the other hand, there is also a little bit of a hype probably. I mean, the fact that there are many people working on that and we believe that that's something that is already here that will change our world and uh, probably will take will change our world, but maybe not in our generation or in the next generation or in the next of the next generation in many years. There was one more question, but I, I missed that one, so... No. Oh, yeah. So I'm not quite sure whether I can rephrase that correctly. How is the situation now going with doing computational pro problems using cold atoms? Um, I mean, how much insight is now given from cold atoms experiments to the behind the theory to the theory? Okay, well, how much insight is now given from the experiments, cold cold experiments. experiments, yeah. Well, I mean, there, there, there is, I mean, we mentioned that there is one of the technologies implementation that is based on cold atoms and with Rindberg states. And I would say that cold atoms have this way of building quantum computer that's very interesting, very competitive with the other ones. But there is another application, we didn't have time to talk about that, which you mentioned that at the beginning, that's quantum simulation. So the fact that quantum computers can solve some particular problems that classical computers cannot solve in simulating materials and so on. And call atoms took the lead already some time ago and they're leading the whole, the whole field of quantum simulation. It's called quantum simulation. And uh, the, the, the experiments of quantum simulation that have happened in the last, say, five to 10 years, I would say that have triggered not only a lot of interest, but also a lot of work. So, I mean, most much of our work and I guess that your work as well is related to these experiments. The fact that people are able to do some things in the experiments like that and, say, and open up new ideas and uh, they also trigger theoretical ideas. So I think that they are influencing a lot our thought and the, and the thoughts of many scientists. It's time to say goodbye. Our hour is over. I hope, really, really hope you enjoyed it. And thank you to Ignacio Zirac and Flore Kunst. Usually there would be an applause. Yeah, yeah, I see the hands come up, the applause is coming. <laughs> Thank you guys, Thank and you. goodbye.